Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, a happy Easter to you. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak a little bit this evening about uh, the Easter hope that we have by thinking a little bit about the patterns and the path of God's salvation that's uh, revealed in his scriptures and that, that climaxes, in a sense, in Easter. And I'd like to do that by thinking about a story that we find in the scriptures, the story in the Old Testament, it's the story of Joseph. So hopefully um, you'll have followed along as Hein read from Genesis chapter 37. And if you could have that open in front of you, we'll just go through that story. I'll pick out a few of the texts so we can follow that pattern and see how that applies to God's salvation and particularly to us on this Easter Sunday. So the story of Joseph, it's found in uh, the book of Genesis. And uh, hopefully if you're familiar with, the, with that book, you'll know that uh, it's, uh, it's where the whole world, it comes under the judgment of sin and the curse. And God, but God says there is going to be a blessing and that blessing is going to come through a particular family, a particular man uh, called Abraham. It's a very special family. And we're going to find uh, Joseph, um, who we're gonna be looking at today. He is a member of that family. Um, his, his great, great, great grandfather was Abraham. And we find Joseph as a 17 year old young man or 17 year old boy who is particularly loved by his father and favored by his father, uh, Jacob, to the point at which he makes it clear that Joseph's the one who he wants to carry the blessing. And um, he even gives him a special coat to wear, a special garment, if you've heard of Joseph and his uh, multicolored uh, coat. But obviously, sadly, uh, having this favoritism within the family causes the difficulty between uh, Joseph and his other brothers, and they begin to uh, hate him and become jealous of him. And that particularly gets worse when Joseph begins to have some dreams. So maybe you're familiar with these dreams, but if you look at maybe um, chapter 37, verse 5, it says, Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamt. There we were, bringing sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamt another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come? to bow down to the earth before you. And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. So Joseph is being given these dreams. And during this period of time, this is how God would speak to people in their dreams. So they would know there was meaning to the things that they were dreaming. And they were shocked because they were saying, why, why are you pretending that you're the one who's going to be blessed by God to receive these promises of God that you'll be lifted up and everyone will bow down to you. Well, that's not what happened immediately to Joseph. Sadly, things got worse for him. His brothers were working out in the field and his father, Jacob, sent Joseph to his brothers. But look what happens as they see him coming in uh, verse 18. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. So you can see how bad their envy has got, how sad the situation is that even his own brothers are planning to kill him. But one of his brothers, in a sense, takes mercy on him a little bit and suggests that instead of killing him, they could put him in a pit and just sell him 
and get some money for him and, and, and sell him as a slave to some foreigners. Um, and so they did that as some passing traders were going to another country. They uh, shamefully sold their younger brother for 20 silver coins and he was carried away. And then they went to their father. They went to Jacob the father with, and this is what they said in verse 31. So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats and dipped the tunic in blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colours and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognised it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. So this son, this chosen favoured son of promise, instead of receiving these promises and being raised up, sadly to his father as it can only be seen as dead. It's a hopeless situation. Well, Joseph isn't dead, he is alive, but he's not well. Joseph has now been carried by these traders to the land of Egypt, and he's been sold there to an important official, to the king of Egypt, or what we call the pharaoh of Egypt, the person who was the head of um, the pharaoh's security, a man called Potiphar. And he's a slave in Potiphar's house, doing what he wants, doing what he's told to do. And then, sadly, things get worse for Joseph, as uh, Potiphar's wife becomes attracted to Joseph and she tries to proposition in him so that they can be intimate together and uh, Joseph um, rejects this which uh, provokes her and then um, she as he flees away as she's angry with him she grabs his garment and then begins to accuse him of trying to abuse her uh, in this way abuse her physically so this is what she says if we move to uh, chapter 39 now in verse 16 so she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened, as I lifted up my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke about him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. So not only had Joseph been sold as a slave, he's now been falsely accused and found himself in the king's prison. He's alongside two other criminals who, who are there. And uh, he is, it couldn't really get much worse for Joseph now. He's far from home. And he must feel that these dreams, these promises given to him are so far removed from him. But uh, in the same way that Joseph had dreams that had meanings, so the uh, fellow prisoners with Joseph began to have dreams which troubled them. And, uh, but God was with Joseph, so he was able to give Joseph the meaning of these dreams. And he told one of the prisoners, sadly, you will not make it out of this prison. But he said to the other one, you will make it out of here. In three days, you'll be restored to go back to be with the king, to be with Pharaoh. And he just asked them, he said, you know, think about my situation. Could you remember me to the king? Could you help me out? Um, but sadly, that servant who went to be with the king uh, forgot about Joseph. And Joseph was there for many years, uh, almost feeling abandoned in prison. Now that is until something happens. And that is that the dream comes to the king of Egypt. It comes to the pharaoh this time. And the pharaoh is very distressed wanting to know the meaning of this dream. So then that reminds the servant who was with the king who was with Joseph in prison. And he says, actually, I, I know someone who could potentially interpret this dream for you. So then if you look at uh, chapter 41 in Genesis, this is what happens to Joseph in verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. 
but I have heard it is said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh had had this dream where he saw um, seven um, uh, ears of corn, grain and uh, seven uh, cows and they were very healthy and they were lots. It looked like there was an abundance and um, they were followed by seven uh, unhealthy uh, ears of corn, grain and uh, seven unhealthy cows. And Joseph says, well, this is God telling you that you are going to have seven years of great farming, great harvest, loads of food. But that is going to be followed by seven years of famine with not much food. So Joseph advised the king Pharaoh to prepare and said, during those seven years where there's lots, you should be preparing for the seven years of famine. And this is the wonderful thing that's happened through this situation. That how Pharaoh sees what's happened to Joseph. And this is what he says to Joseph now. Remember, this is Joseph who not long ago was in the pit, was in the dungeon. And then in chapter 41, verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this? A man in whom the spirit of God. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, insomuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning, as wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring of his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain around his neck, and he made him ride he made him ride in the servant in the second chariot which he had, and they cried out before him, "Bow the knee." So, so he sent him over, set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, "I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt." So you can imagine what this must have been like for Joseph. He's gone from that place of being in the pit. For his brother sold into slavery. He's gone from being falsely accused and in a jail cell, forgotten and abandoned, to now he's been lifted up to this new life where he's been given this authority, he's been given this responsibility, he's been used by God. And then now, even as his dreams are being fulfilled, as what God told him is being fulfilled, the people are going to be bowing down to him. And that he is going to be that source of blessing so that when the famine comes, he's going to be storing up for those seven good years. And people are going to come to him and he's going to be the one God uses to provide food for all the needy people. And even for his own brothers who come from another country, they will end up bowing down to him and receiving the blessing from him. So that's what happens to Joseph. He's that son who is promised so many things, does not get him straight away but goes through the pit, through the dungeon, and then God lifts him up to the highest place. So that's the story of Joseph. And there's a sense in which it's just, it is a nice story. We like it because we like stories with happy endings. It's nice to see how, how that ended for Joseph. But it's very important for us, especially around this Easter time, because it reminds us the paths of God's salvation, the pattern within in which he works to save us. See, that, that idea of that chosen son, that unlikely son of promise, who's been given such blessings, but does not receive them straight away, but in, in fact, sadly, is lost, only to be restored again in a wonderful way uh, to their father, is a story that's told time and time again in the Old Testament. You'll see it with Isaac, the son of Abraham. You'll see it with Jacob, with his family. You'll see it with Joseph. It's even expanded out as you think about uh, God's people in the Old Testament who are called an insignificant people, but they're God's son. And they're given so many promises, but sadly they sin against God and they lose them. They're taken away by surrounding uh, empire, <coughs> empires, Babylon and Assyria, only to be brought back again in wonderful restoration, only to be brought back again with that symbol of new life, that work of God, that his path of salvation, his path of blessings. 
And so then that's so important because that comes to its fulfillment in that Easter message, that Easter story that we've been thinking about uh, for over this weekend. That's who Jesus is, isn't it? That Jesus is that chosen, that beloved, that special son of promise. The one who all these promises of God are focused upon. All the prophecies of the Old Testament, they find their fulfillment in Jesus, who looks like an unlikely son of promise, just a carpenter or a builder from the Middle East. But the Bible says that no, he is the source of all the blessings for all the world. He is the source of life for this world so ruined by death. He is that source of washing and cleansing from this sin-sick world. He is that ruler and that king which God has promised to this world who's going to restore justice to this world that's lost so much corruption. But again, if you think about the story of Jesus, it follows that same pattern, doesn't it? That he doesn't receive those blessings immediately. No, initially he is rejected by his fellow people in his nation who are also descended from Abraham. Who are in his sense his family, his brothers. They're also jealous of him. So they turn him over to some other people and they reject him. And like Joseph, Jesus is sold. He's sold for pieces of silver. They take his garment from him. He's left and abandoned and like Joseph finds himself in a languishing in a dark and dingy prison cell with two criminals so Jesus Christ that son of promise that one who all our hopes are in is found crucified on a cross next to two criminals that one in whom we would think all of our hopes all of our blessings are focused it seems that all things are lost as we were thinking on Good Friday that he is crucified Where is the hope? Where is this salvation that we hoped for in him? But in the same way that that remarkable restoration of Joseph happens, God has not abandoned his son. He doesn't leave him. And that's what we celebrate at Easter time, isn't it? That in the same way that Joseph is wonderfully brought out of that dungeon and put up on that high place next to the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, Jesus Christ ascends, he rises from the grave on Easter morning, so much higher than to the right hand of uh, the king of Egypt. He ascends to the right hand of God. He ascends to that place which is called the Lord of Lords and he is called the King of Kings. Not only to uh, rule over Egypt, but to rule over the world. Not only to be a blessing to the nations to give food during times of famine, but to give eternal life, to provide forgiveness of sins for people. And this is the wonderful thing that we celebrate during this Easter time, is that he shares that resurrection power with us. The promises of the New Testament are that that resurrection, which is pictured in Joseph, that we see fulfilled in Jesus Christ, can be our experience too. That that way you're shocked that Joseph went from such a dark place to being up to a place of such blessing. And Christ has gone from the pit of death to that resurrection glory. So also the promises for those who believe in him are that they can share in that resurrection as well. How the Apostle Paul puts it is that we are joined with him. He says for... I have been crucified with Christ. I join him in that crucifixion. As many of us were baptised into Christ Jesus, were baptised into his death, we join him in that pit, in a sense, as he joins us in our pit of sin. But as Jesus was not left there, as he was brought up in that wonderful resurrection experience, so we are brought up as well. And the Apostle Paul says that Christ Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. We can experience that resurrection, life from the dead power in our day-to-day lives. Paul says, for we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And that's the wonderful thing we praise Jesus for in this Easter time, isn't it? That though in the same way, the pattern of God works, that it goes from the pit and the dungeon to that resurrected place where God has lifted them up, we can be part of that too. And I think that's very, this, this pattern that we see in the scriptures, this pattern which God has given to us in the Old Testament and in Christ and his salvation, it's very important for us in our day-to-day lives, particularly for, for three reasons at this time. 
Firstly, it's important for us as because I'm sure there's many of us who will think about that resurrection of Christ, think about that life from the dead, and think about what the Bible teaches that you can experience that same thrill of living a new life um, in Christ, knowing that power. But how? How is it that you can experience that resurrection power? Well, that pattern that we see that works through the scriptures that we see in Joseph is the pattern that God has given us to understand that there's only one way to the resurrection and it's fire the way of the cross. That we have to go to that place where we first confront our own sin, be honest and confront the reality of our own pit that we're in, of our own sins. Acknowledge, maybe like Joseph, who was chained in that dungeon, that we are prisoners of sin and we are helpless. And there is only one way out of the darkness, is when we see that someone else has come into that darkness with us. Jesus Christ has come into the darkness of our sin in that dungeon and made a path for us out of it. He is the one who has left before us and led the way out. And it's only seeing Jesus suffering for our sins, suffering in our darkness and our death on the cross, and seeing our forgiveness which will provide for us that freedom which you can experience through that forgiveness of God and through that love of God. So like Joseph, who was released from that prison to live that new life, lifted up on high, so if you confront your sins and see Jesus Christ on the cross in the darkness of your sins with you there, seeing that freedom that you begin to experience that new life, that new life in him and join him in his resurrection. So firstly, it's important this pattern, this path of salvation we see because we want to live that new Easter resurrection life in Jesus. But secondly, it's important for us as well, as we think about maybe our own experience at this present time, or maybe a period in your life where we think about what Joseph would have experienced in that pit, in that dungeon. He would have been very frustrated, very lonely, maybe felt abandoned by God. He would have gone, I have these dreams, I have these promises, but God has forgotten them. He's not going to come to me. Well, and you might particularly think that during this uh, time when you're in isolation because the sadly of the virus that's going around. You might feel frustrated. There's things that you want to be doing. There's things that you want to be doing for Christ and his kingdom and his gospel. And you think, what's happening? Why, why are we being chained like this? But the story of Joseph is helpful and this pattern of God's salvation is helpful because you can see that this is often part of God's plan. This is part of how God works his salvation. You can think, can't you, in the New Testament, the example of the Apostle Paul, who was a servant of Jesus, who was called to minister to Jesus and his kingdom. And you can think that Jesus, Paul would have said, I've got so much I want to do, so much I want to achieve for my Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul finds himself chained in prison. He must have felt so frustrated, like he was wasting time. Why has God put me here? But again, Paul would have been similar to Joseph. This is just part of God's pattern. And you know, don't you, that Jesus was able to make Paul so fruitful in his time during prison that he was there converting fellow prisoners, converting the guards, and he was there writing parts of our New Testament, which you today have been blessed by. That even in that time, and maybe you're in the pit, God can make you fruitful. So that's the second thing that's helpful for us during this time. That maybe to feel a bit uh, isolated and to feel that you're being a bit chained or that um, God has given you a season when you're not being as fruitful as you'd like. Remember that can be part of God's pattern. It's part of his path of leading you to greater things. It's just a season when you need to be in that pit, in that dungeon. A period of uh, maybe a bit of frustration. But thirdly, we want to think about that Easter hope that we have. And again, particularly during this time when people are experiencing this lockdown. And a lot of the things we'll talk about is, well, when will this come to an end? You know, is this how it's going to be forever? When are things going to get back to normal? Well, the Easter message reminds us, no, things are never not going to be like this forever. The Easter hope is to know that we have a, a future hope of when all things are going to experience that same resurrection which you've already seen in Jesus Christ. And as you anticipate leaving the lockdown, as you anticipate maybe having a bit more freedom and gradually getting back to normal, 
use that sense of longing to have uh, to fuel that greater hope which you have in Christ's return for that final resurrection that Easter hope we have in Christ Jesus, where it's more than just being able to leave your houses and to see your friends and family again and give them a hug, but it's going to be when you can leave and be free from sin and free from sickness and free from viruses, not only to see your friends here, but to see your friends have already passed on before us. So we have that hope, that we have a hope to leave quarantine, don't we? But we have a greater hope, that as Jesus Christ has risen from the grave, so we will follow him in that in the end, in the final resurrection, when he restores all things to himself. So, that is God's pattern for salvation. We, are, we experience that resurrection, but it goes via the cross, via the cross that pays for our sins. And now during this time of lockdown, we maybe feel frustrated. We know that it can be part of God's plan, that we have a future resurrection hope to spur us on. Just like to finish by reading um, one of the hopes we have written down in the book of Revelation where it says, Blessed and holy is he who is part of the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So happy Easter to all of you.